This class was pre-recorded, uh, but I will review the, the chat for any questions that you may have. We're in the study of the book of Ephesians, and we are in class 19. Uh, I am Messianic teacher, Elder Rusty Simpson. Uh, the class will air on March 20th, 2021, which will be the 6th of Aviv, 5781. Now, this slide that I have before you, um, we've been looking at uh, this, the longest sentence in the New Testament, in fact, in all the, of Scripture, uh, coming from Ephesians chapter 1, verses thir uh, 3 to 14. And notice that I have up here that I've started with the ESV. Uh, I have placed an asterisk with that because what I have done is to replace uh, with those areas that are bolded in white, uh, where the Greek says something different uh, than what the, the ESV translation uh, has rendered. And uh, in those places, and there aren't that many of them, most of it's uh, fairly close, there are some differences here that, that I think give us some additional insights, and, and we're going to walk and talk through these uh, today. Uh, some of these we've talked about previously here in verse uh, 3. We have, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing among the heavenlies. And, and uh, that is how it's rendered in the Greek, often in the modern translation, translations that will render that as among the heavenly places, but places doesn't actually appear in the text. And I have suggested before, and I would suggest again, that really what this is pointing back to is blessings. So it would be with every spiritual blessing among the heavenly blessings. Okay, continuing in verse four, uh, even as he sh chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and flawless before him in love. Now, that word that is uh, that I've rendered here as flawless, in fact, that's what the, the word in the Greek means, um, it, it's often translated or rendered as blameless. Um, and I think the, the difference and, and the reason that I would, would leave it as flawless is because the concept of being flawless is one of those that we see across the Old Testament, uh, in, uh, far back as uh, Genesis chapter 17, um, we have uh, the commandment that is uh, given to Abram to walk before me to my face uh, and become you flawless. It's not a command to be flawless. It's a command to, to be in the process of being flawless. Um, our God it is a just God and he understands where we're at and requires of us to be uh, in the process of pressing into flawlessness and recognize that, that, that only his son Yeshua uh, could actually be flawless. Um, so the other portion of the, the tail end of this, um, and we've talked about this previously, but all of these so far, so I haven't included any of the Greek here. To, to prove that again, those are proved in earlier classes. Um, again, we have at the tail end of four uh, that we should be holy and flawless before him in love. And, and keeping the uh, in love with the tail end of verse four as opposed to, uh, as the ESV does, uh, having it uh, be the opening statement of verse um, uh, of and that, that then proceeds into verse 5. Um, the difference in these is that when we look at the way that Paul constructed his sentences, the way that it's rendered here on the screen would be consistent with his other uses of, of these sorts of, of descriptions. Um, and in fact, uh, with both within Ephesians and, and outside Ephesians. Um, so we have continuing in, in verse uh, 5, uh, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. And of course, the beloved is Christ. Uh, in him, we have deliverance 
through his blood the forgivenesses of our offenses uh, in accord with the riches of his grace which he lavished into us in every wisdom and moral insight so these two statements uh, that we have in in uh, verses 7 and 8 we will look at a little bit more closely in the Greek to show that that indeed the that is how it is rendered now this is the ESV uh, for Ephesians chapter 1 verses 7 to 10 and it reads in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him things in heaven and things on earth As we look at this in the Greek, though, what we see is in whom we are having the deliverance through the blood of him, uh, the forgiveness of the offenses uh, in accord with the riches of the grace of him. And those may seem like uh, somewhat trivial changes, but I do think that they they bring to uh, bear on the text uh, into our understanding uh, insights uh, that we don't get in the, the ESV as it is rendered. Um, for instance, when we consider the, the concept of deliverance, um, the, the concept of deliverance and, and being delivered uh, from the offenses um, in, is really what uh, we're talking about here. And Redemption and deliverance, although very similar, are, are not necessarily uh, the same. One can be redeemed from the choices that one makes. Um, one can be delivered out of circumstances and out of things that are beyond their control. And the, um, the understanding here, again, in replacing the one for the other, I think will become a little bit more clear as we move forward in the text and, and consider uh, G3900, um, which is uh, rendered as trespasses or as, as sins, sins in the King James Version, um, but which means offenses. Now remember both trespasses and sins are technical labels for specific categories of offenses and specific categories of, of um, sin. Um, yet offenses has a much broader um, understanding than, than just those things uh, that we do. Um, I would point out that uh, in, in coming, uh, Yeshua addresses this in the one aspect um, it's not just what we have done, um, but what we have considered and what we have thought about. Um, our sins, our offenses before God are as much a thought process. Uh, we have committed them already if we have not, uh, if we have thought about them rather than uh, just going through the act. So if I'm angry with my brother, I have murdered him already. If I have looked upon uh, a woman with lust, uh, then I have committed adultery with her already. And, and so it's a broadening of those categories. But I would also hearken back to that concept of Tamim. And we've talked uh, many times about how uh, within the Tanakh, uh, we have this differentiation that we lose when it's translated into the English. Uh, the differentiation between being tamim, being flawless, uh, that call that is placed upon Abraham to uh, walk before me fa to my face and become you flawless. Um, and in differentiating that from being without blemish, uh, moon low. Uh, and these two are, are not the same. They do carry a moral connotation to it. But the moon low, in addition, also carries a physical connotation. And whereas 
Um, one may be redeemed from one's choices. Um, one can actually be delivered from the moon that one might have. And in fact, we know that upon our glorification, upon the return of Yeshua HaMashiach, we will have, in fact, just that, not just a uh, body that still bears the sins uh, and bears the, the uh, blemishes, uh, both from sins that we have done, sins that have been done to us, and just from moving through this life. Um, we will be, in that instance, both uh, tamim, flawless, uh, morally uh, and physically, as well as mumlo, without blemish. Um, and so I would say that, that the two of these go together to cover that broader understanding of, of what it is that we will be, um, the, the fullness of what Christ's death on the cross and his blood has provided for us. Um, uh, to to not just pay for those sins, but then to to um, deliver us into out of out of that sin state, out of that physical state, into the state that we we shall be. Likewise, when we look at this last word in uh, verse seven, uh, according to kata is the the word in the Greek. And uh, the ESV translates that as according to, uh, denoting the riches of his grace. Um, but we see in the, the Greek, uh, both this concept of according to, we see that in the, the light blue, that's kind of the, the typical uh, translation. Uh, but, but the word um, actually means in accord with. And the argument that I'm going to make to you is that, that these two concepts, though related, are not necessarily one and the same, and that a better rendition of this would be in accord with rather than according to. And the analogy that I would give to you is that of a uh, manufacturing uh, plant. And uh, let's say that they uh, get a contract from the government to make supplies uh, to make a specific part for the military. Um, that contract comes with a very rigid uh, de uh, description of both the specifications of the part, both in a physical specif specification, but also from a duty cycle sort of specification. Um, you can imagine that, that if you make a uh, firing pin uh, that only works once or only works twice rather than tens of thousands of times, um, you might have an issue. Did the part meet the criteria for what it physically was supposed to be originally? Well, right up until you considered what it was made of and whether it was durable uh, to the specifications that it needed to be. And so um, all of these contracts always uh, have with within them, uh, because anytime you're manufacturing uh, things, um, you always have a, a specificity as to um, the percentage of parts that you supply that are required to meet specifications. And um, the reality in, in the world is that, um, that not a hundred percent of what you produce is is going to meet that criteria. The more critical something is, the more um, the more rigid the manufacturing, which means the more expensive the manufacturing. And so um, the difference between a, an AK-47 that can be stamped out of of steel and has very loose tolerances, but you know that when you pull the trigger, it's going to go bang. You just don't know exactly where the bullet's going to go. The difference between that and uh, an AR or a uh, M16 that is machined to very tight tolerances so that, that not only do you know that when you pull the trigger, it's going to go bang, but also that the bullet is going to go exactly where you want it to go, as opposed to somewhere in the area of where you wanted it to go. 
Um, and so the the comparisons between those two weapons, uh, of course, the the uh, AK-47 was just phenomenal with with being able to put up with conditions that the M16 could not, uh, as far as getting dirt and water and uh, all kinds of other um, uh, contaminants from the environment. Um, all of those things end up being important, and um, the the weapons that are made to um, to participate in an Olympic sniper competition or a sharpshooting competition are at much higher tolerances, but but with the understanding that, that they will do that for a certain period of time and then you have to replace those parts. You can think of that as tires, right? Uh, some tires are, are made to, um, to, to last for 60,000 miles, others are made to last for 20,000 miles. Race tires are made to, to last for, you know, upwards of uh, two or 300 miles. And so they have to change the tires in the midst of the race. Um, and so all of these concepts kind of come to, to bear in this. Um, if you have a manu two manufacturing um, companies, uh, each of which is, has the exact same contract to manufacture the exact same part, right? They, they, if they were going to pull according to what they had manufactured, um, they know that, that as they sort through those parts, um, a percentage of those parts meet the specifications, a percentage of them don't and can be sold as non-mil spec parts, um, still useful, but, but not up to the military specifications. And so um, the, the according to would be the concept of, of supplying your contract to the military according to what had been manufactured. Some of those parts meet it, some of those parts don't. As long as, as once you have delivered all of the parts, the total numbers that are required to meet specification do so, right? And that's going to be a percentage of the total that you that you have have provided to them. As long as you've met that criteria, you're okay. But you compare that to another manufacturer that says that that we want to manufacture things in in accord with how we do business and how we see things. And now it's not a question of what do we physically have that we have produced that, that can be provided, um, but the question is what is it that, that we would produce from, from the concept of being in accord with our values and, um, and our nature. And that company would maybe produce the exact same number of parts as the first, but then continue to produce more parts until 100% of the parts that they could supply would meet the criteria for being in mil spec, because that by nature is who they are, as opposed to, to knowing that they could get away with less. So the difference again between according to what they had on hand versus in accord with their their um, their ethics and their business model of of who they are and what they are going to be supplying, and I think this concept applies well, because when you think of it from the standpoint of in accord with the nature of God's grace, right? It's not just that they're pulling from the grace that God has to supply. But it has to be in accord with the nature of God. And I would take that a step further and point out that whereas in the Greek and the English, we narrow these things down in a manner that is not helpful. Uh, in the Hebrew, we would recognize that, that this grace is, is likely to be tied not just to the narrow concept of giving something that, to someone that they don't deserve, or letting them get away with something that that uh, with a violation that they have made, but it would be more consistent to understand this with uh, in accord with Chesed, 
right? And that Strong's number H2416, this Hebrew word, which, which encompasses the concept of loving kindness, mercy, and grace, which makes a way possible when there is no way possible for man. Right? In, in the English, it, it'll get translated as loving kindness or as mercy or as grace. But, but truly, this nature of God is, is one that is, is driving much of what he does. It's his loving kindness, mercy, and grace together, all of it, which is going to make that way possible where there is no way possible for man. And so I would suggest to you that, that understanding this from that perspective, uh, the perspective of what it is that God is doing in maintaining his nature to himself uh, that is is driving this. And so it is out of the or in accordance with the, the richness of the grace of of God. Uh, his chesed, by which these things are, are being provided. Ephesians uh, 1.8, really short verse, uh, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight in the ESV. When we look at this in the Greek, uh, we also get which he lavishes into us in uh, all uh, wisdom and, and prudence. Uh, when we look at it in the King James, it reads there on the right side of the screen, wherein he hath abounded towards us in all wisdom and prudence. Okay, and, and prudence, this concept of prudence is not one that, that we banter around very much, uh, other than uh, to, to tie it into um, uh, the derogatory sort of concept of being a prude, um, right? That's one that, that most people would understand as a negative, but not necessarily understand what it truly means. And so as we look at this, um, I would, would point out that it is into us. He lavishes into us. And here the every or the all, either one of these for this Greek word can be uh, related um, identically uh, and, 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 but there is a difference between all and every, right? All wisdom is all the wisdom of God. But if it's every wisdom, it's every wisdom that God has provided to us. So he lavishes into us in every wisdom and prudence, right? And, and, and. I would say that, that that's a better understanding of this. So and then that leaves the question of, of what is this word prudence that, that we're looking at? And here, uh, this is Strong's number G5428. Uh, it is understood as a mental action or activity, uh, i.e. an intellectual or moral insight. And, and so that, that becomes important to our understanding of this. So so. In the ESV, we see that it retains that concept of insight in all wisdom and insight. Well, how much insight does God have into his wisdom? And the answer to that is that there is no insight that God has into his wisdom, right? The very concept of having an insight is to have a group of facts, an understanding, and then based upon either that or something external, having a deeper understanding that that is not there on the surface. That's why it's in sight. However, God is perfectly wisdom and perfectly sighted. There is no insight that he attains, that he gets, that he comes to the conclusion of. Um, he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so it, it, it really is speaking not about the global wisdom and, and understanding of God, but more from the standpoint of, of the insights that are put into us. So when you put that together with, um, 
with this concept of prudence, and a prude is is one who is is moral or has moral insight, right? That's why it is a concept of of de, of denigration um, that is bantered around because people inherently don't like the fact that others um, are moral, and so they when when pressed. And, and confronted with their own moral ineptitude, and they will will call people prudes. Uh, well, you're just a prude uh, because because you're going to to keep uh, keep the law or keep that which which God has said to do. Um, and yet here it is that that it is God who has lavished into us, into you and into me every wisdom and moral insight and and i would i would say it that way because i think again most of us just we, we have a vague understanding of what prude means or prudence means um but we don't we don't really um we don't utilize that word in a way that that really drives home what the what the point is now verse nine has just a very minor uh issue in it and one with which I will take no issue at all, but I do think it's important to point out. So in the ESV, uh, it reads, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. When we look at that in the Greek, what we see is making known to us uh, the secret uh, of the will of him in accord with the delight of him which he purposed in him notice that there there's no christ there um it, when we see it in the king james the king james actually renders it not about christ but about god himself having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself and and i would say that that it's not that the, the two of these are, are contradicting each other. Um, I would say the, the understanding of these truly has to, to be set forth in our understanding that Christ is God. And um, I would just point out to you that as we say the Shema each week, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohinu, Adonai Echad, God is one. And so he purposes both within himself and also in Christ because they are one and the same. There is no light that passes between the two of them. Um, Ephesians 1.10 uh, really doesn't have any changes, but there are some important concepts here. Um, we have uh, verse 10 reading in the ESV as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. And it's important to remember that, that what God is, is doing, uh, and we see this both in the concept of the Shabbat for uh, man, the seven day weekly cycle, but also the seven yearly cycle of the Shabbat for the land, that eventually at the great Jubilee, that all things are going to be brought together, that the people are going to be returned to the land that is theirs, that the, that the land itself will have a renewal. And, and this is a picture of that time to come. Uh, Revelations chapter 21 uh, speaks to this uh, specifically when uh, there will be a new heaven and a new earth and all things will, will have passed away. Um, and, and have to, because uh, as we see both in the time of Noah and as we, we know today, it's not just the people that are corrupt, but all the earth is corrupt as well. And so um, both of these have to be renewed. Um, we talked about this a little last week, that it, around the time of the Passover, um, because of, of the nature of the traditions 
that are required in order to for one to be ritually clean in order to participate for the Passover. Um, there was great effort undertaken to make sure that graves were whitewashed and marked, and that that if there was a bone fragment in the street, that 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 was was circled and and marked. Um, so that, that people wouldn't unintentionally come in contact with that which was, is unclean and thereby become ceremonially unclean themselves and then unable to celebrate the Passover. Um, this is why the, the uh, Sadducees and the Pharisees would not enter into uh, uh, the palace of, uh, of either Herod or uh, particularly though with uh, the Roman um, uh, wait for the plane to pass uh, the Roman consul uh, because because to do so to enter into the home of a Gentile would make them unclean and so they they just would not do it um, Recognize that that uh, that just as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are echad, that that the Gospel of John drives home the point to us over and over and over again that the goal here is not just for they to be echad, but for us to be echad with them, and that they would be innocent with us, and that that by this way um, all things are are going to be made anew, and that's that's our glorification, the hope to. Uh, and the promise to, to come. Um, and here too, uh, again, uh, Adonai Echad, God is one and we will be one. And, and that's the promise that, that we have. So looking at the two of these, and we'll start with the bottom. Uh, in the ESV, it would read, uh, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will. And, and notice that, that when you read that, is that in all wisdom and insight of God, or is that all wisdom and insight provided to us. Um, again, the, the, the reading that we'll undertake, I think, provides more clarity to that. Uh, uh, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, uh, that concept of appointment even here to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. One of the, the things that is in concepts that is uh, that that comes out of uh, this liberal theology um, that starts in the the Middle Ages and propagates forth, um, but also resides uh, within the Jews, and and I would say that that to some greater degree, the commonality of the issue at hand for both of them is an issue of works. And so um, there are many uh, Jews who, who feel that, um, that it is their works that remakes society, that the remaking <clears throat> of society is occurring today as opposed to um, when the Hamashiach comes back. Um, likewise, there are Christians who feel that due to the fact that it, it's their works that, that the that they will create on earth and it is their goal and their job given to them by God to create on earth a new heaven and a new earth, not one that will be brought by God, but one that is brought by the works uh, and, and changes that man brings both to himself and to his, his fellow man. And I would just say that scripture does not speak of that. Um, uh, speakers, uh, scripture speaks uh, of this plan uh, being that the plan that is uh, is God's plan. Again, we, we see there in um, at the end of verse nine in Christ, but it's in Him, right? And and my resolution of that is to say, well, Yeshua and God the Father are echad, um, but it's. It's, a, it's their plan 
uh, to unite all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. When we leave the, the Greek alone and now looking at the top half, uh, in him we have deliverance. And again, this is going to be the deliverance through his blood, both from our, our active sins, our trespasses and our sins, uh, our shortcomings, but also the deliverance from the state that we are in, um, be it due to our own choices or external to us, um, or even due to to happenstance of of how we were created uh, think of those that were were created um that that developed birth defects uh when they were um when they were in that process of of being in the womb uh or had uh some sort of accident that that uh, leaves them maimed um, it's a deliverance through his blood for the forgiveness of our offenses and again that offenses terms it's an offense to God and Leviticus is very clear about this that, that the offenses to God are not just in what we do Yeshua says it's also in what we think though nobody can see it but it's also in the moon the blemishes that we have remember the, the blemish would invalidate your ability to serve uh, in the temple of God because it was was offensive to God because flawlessness and and moom low were required both of the sacrifices uh, the animals that were being brought that pointed to Yeshua but also in you and I um, and, and again this is in accord with the nature of God the riches uh, of his grace which he lavished lavished into us in every wisdom and moral insight it doesn't mean that we received the totality of of all wisdom um, and insight but in what we do receive he, he is lavishing into us every wisdom and moral insight making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ uh, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Now Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 in the ESV reads, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Now when we look at this in the Greek, uh, we see something a little bit different. And I would draw your attention to the fact that in both the ESV and in the King James, you have this phrase, obtained an inheritance. In what they are translating uh, into, the, into the English is that, is this word in the Greek that has to do with casting lots. And we were allotted or the lot was cast. Now, we also have this word predestined and we talked about this earlier and the uh, verse 11 is the other verse in which it shows up uh, within uh, chapter one of, of Ephesians. Again, there's, there's only six total uh, in, the, in the New Testament and uh, only five of those really are pertinent to the idea of whether or not God predestined us uh, or and, and understanding what that means. Um, noticed here though that that this whole concept of casting a lot is uh, is not happenstance uh, even though today we may talk about flipping a coin uh, this was something that that was used as an oracle by God to control and to to disseminate information as to what the appropriate uh, course of action would be and we'll talk about that here in a few moments a little bit more um, we have this concept of uh, acting uh, in in accord with uh, and we, we talked about that before or according to um, in this concept where we have um, working all things according to the counsel of his will is is what's being pointed to here in in the Greek and notice that that whereas before we had predestined according to uh, 
to the counsel of his will or to the purposes of him. Um, here we have uh, it spoken of in, in two different fashions, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So it, it really kind of doubles down on the concept that it's God that is, is doing this. When we compare this to verse 5, again, we see that he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, uh, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he blessed us in the beloved. And, and again, you can see the parallels in here. Um, you, you have more information added in verse 11, according to the purpose uh, of his will is there as well, but now it's expanded to be according to the purpose of him uh, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And, and uh, again, I would just say that that uh, expands further this concept that we see in verse 5. When we talk about the casting of lots, um, it's important to recognize that, that it's really not associated with the things that we think of today. Uh, gotquestions.com, there's a link there to uh, this concept of casting lots. And uh, what they basically say is that, that uh, though it's mentioned 70 times in the Old Testament and seven times in the New Testament, uh, in spite of the many references to casting lot in the Old Testament, nothing is known about the actual lots themselves. Uh, they could have been sticks of various lengths, flat stones like coins, or some kind of dice, but their exact nature is unknown. The closest modern practice to casting lots is likely flipping a coin. And they're making this guess based on having said that they, they really don't know anything about them. And so um, I would just say that, that that's a very hazardous way uh, to go about things. Uh, that being said, um, they then continue uh, that the New Testament uh, nowhere instructs Christians to use a method similar to casting lots to help with decision making. And that is true. And I think that is very important. And, and um, I think that starts to reveal the, the tenor of the flavor of what they're trying to, to, uh, to talk about here. Um, and they say, now that we have the completed word of God, as well as the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to guide us, there is no reason to be using games of chance to make decisions. And, and I would bristle quite a bit at that. Um, they are absolutely positively correct. We have the completed work of God, as well as the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to guide us. Um, and so um, there's no reason to reach for things of that nature that, uh, that although they would call them uh, games of chance, I think they're besmirching um, the Word of God uh, because that's not what the Word of God said about these things. Um, now, it's important to recognize that uh, the, the time of utilization of those things is long, long past. And so um, we are... Uh, endured against uh, reaching and speaking to uh, mediums and to uh, using other uh, ways of, of uh, trying to discern the world outside of the will of God, um, because invariably those things are, are not going to be of God, but they're going to be of, uh, of Satan, and we really should stay away from them. Um, so I would agree that the word uh, of the word, the spirit, and prayer is sufficient. I would add to that, though, um, fellowship, uh, and this is where um, you know a three uh, a three stranded rope is going to be much stronger than a single strand. Um, we really need to to be reaching for all of these things uh, when trying to discern God's will today. And I would agree, not casting lots, rolling dice, or flipping a coin. So that being said, um, there are seven times in the Tanakh where uh, the casting of lots, Urim and Thurim, are spoken of. And, and again, over 70 times where casting of lots is, is uh, spoken of uh, as well. 
The Urim and the Thurim, though, were the way in which the lots were to be cast. And when we look at Exodus chapter 28, verse 30, what we see here is that uh, we have the breastplate of judgment. And, and that's an important concept. And then you have the, the Ha Urim and uh, and also the the ha, uh, and, and this one I always struggle with, the mimim. And uh, I would draw your attention to the fact that, that the roots for these words come from words that we're already familiar with. Uh, er being uh, light, and, and for the other one, tamim, uh, the flawlessness. Right? And so within the breastplate of God was a pouch in which the high priest would keep the Urim and Thummim. And these were the light and the flawlessness uh, of, of God. Uh, and they would be used as an oracle uh, to try to discern and understand things. Leviticus chapter 8, verse 8 um, also gives us uh, this this discussion uh, about and he put the brace, breastplate on him and also he put in the breastplate uh, the urim and the the thummim. Numbers twenty seven verse twenty one uh, is is speaking to um, instructions that was given to Moses. Uh, by which he was to raise up uh, Yeshua, um, him whom we usually call Joshua. Um, but in fact, his name was Yeshua. Uh, Yeshua uh, was one of the, the people who went into to the land. He was the one who stuck by Moses uh, and, and would not leave the, the tent of appointment. Um, and when Israel is getting ready to come into the land and the time for Moses is ready to pass. God is giving instructions on how to raise uh, up before the people of Israel, uh, Yeshua, so that, that they would recognize Yeshua as, as, uh, as the individual that was, was taking Moses' place. Now, it would be easy enough to just pass that off and say, well, let's just stick with the name of Joshua and and let it be at that. But recognize that that what has been foreshadowed uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 18 is that, that God told Moses to tell the people that he was going to raise up for them uh, one unto like himself uh, from amongst their brothers. Uh, and that this person that God would put his, um, his words into his mouth and anybody who didn't listen to him, he would hold them accountable. And, and so we see that the foreshadowing of this in Yeshua um, that, that, again, most of us understand is Joshua uh, because they, there was a concern that uh, if they made it Yeshua or the, the uh, Germanic form of that uh, Jesus, then people would get confused as to who it was really that was being spoken of. And, and interestingly, we're going to see that again here in just a few moments. So the individual that is being raised up in, in Moses's place, it says that um, not only will he be brought out before the people to, so that the people will see that God uh, is placing uh, the authority in, um, into uh, Yeshua, but also that before the face of Eleazar the priest, remember Aaron has died at this point, and his son Eleazar is, has taken that, that role of high priest. And um, God is telling Moses to have uh, uh, Yeshua stand before him and that he would ask him in the judgments uh, for uh, judgments in, in the lights. So to use the Urim um, before the Lord and that, that it's up to Yeshua as to when they go out and when they come in and, um, and that when 
he goes, all the children of Israel will also go. And so really vesting that authority uh, into uh, Yeshua. We have Deuteronomy 33, uh, verse 8. And we're actually going to look at verses 8 through 11 or 12. I uh, can't remember which. Um, and the reason for that is this comes in the midst of a... Uh, blessing that is being given to each of the tribes and on the tribe of Levi it says and of Levi he said let the Thummim and thy Urim uh, be with the Holy One uh, whom thou didst prove at, at Massa and with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Meribah and again we have this uh, Urim and the, the Thummim that's being mentioned. Uh, but here I want to draw your attention to for whom it is. Now they're speaking of Moses, right? The, the people strove against uh, Moses at Massa and also at Meribah. And, but look at, at how Moses is being described, right? And, and there in the red box uh, on the far right-hand side, you, you get uh, this this word that originates out of chesed out of that loving kindness mercy and grace that makes a way possible when there is no way possible for man that's an attribute of god and moses is being described uh with that that attribute um and um and and i don't think that's unimportant again the individual that's going to fill that role be it the yeshua of that replaces moses or the Yeshua that will come and go to the cross. Um, these are, are, are foreshadowings in the case of, of Yeshua at the time of Moses of the Yeshua to come. And also, uh, just because I love the concept, uh, notice that it also says that you probed him there. Uh, that Nassau is, a, is that deep sniff test that is given uh, by which things are uh, found to be either uh, w good or or bad, but our noses are most discriminating um, sense that we have. Verse nine of Deuteronomy 33 uh, in the King James says, who said unto his fathers and his mothers, uh, I have not seen him, neither did he acknowledge his brother, nor knew his own children, for they have observed thy word and kept thy covenant. Now, it would be really easy to read over this and to, to not think too much of it, but this is an odd thing somewhat to say. And yet, if you think about Yeshua HaMashiach, Right, and specifically when his mother and his, and, and his brothers come, his family comes, and that's the way of saying this, and he basically says, says, you know, who is my mother and who is my father? And um, doesn't recognize either his brothers. Um, this, this statement about the sons of the sons, here's a, a uh, one of these, these uh, Duplicates are, are um, doublets, of in this case of Benet, and um, and I would just say that that as as we are all children of God, um, when Yeshua came, though he knew us from before he formed the foundation of the earth, we hadn't been born yet, and you you could look at that also in a way of uh, though he walked the earth. Uh, and though he was God and is God, um, he, he did not know those of us who were going to be uh, born at a later time uh, in the time that, that he um, was living, even though he, he knew us you know, before he formed us in, a, in our mother's womb. Um, notice that, that they are the ones that, that observe or zealously keep that Shamar uh, verb, uh, Strong's 81, uh, oh, 04, uh, God's sayings. Remember, it's Shema, Shema unto the voice of Adonai, your God, to listen intently uh, with understanding 
uh, and then to give a considered response as to what we're going to do. And the covenant they are preserving. Deuteronomy 33.10 then continues, they shall keep Jacob thy judgments. Uh, remember the Urim and the Thummim are, are both um, specifically there uh, for the judgments. They're in the breastplate of judgment. In Israel thy law, and they shall put incense before thee and whole burnt sacrifice on thy, thy altar. Now, and here you see the incense in the second line, they shall place incense in the nostril of you in, in holy, the kalel, uh, on the altar. And then Deuteronomy uh, verse 11 says, uh, bless the Lord, uh, his substance and accept the work of his hands uh, smite through the loins of them that rise against him and of them that that hate him that they rise not again All right and and we can think both to that moment when uh, when the Levites um, took every man his sword and ran through his his countrymen uh, at the behest of of God um, because the people had so uh, turned their back on Moses at Mount, or on God at Mount Sinai. Um, but you can also think of the second coming, right? And, and that, that time when God is going to go through the land um, and, and Yeshua in his second coming will go through the land and smite those that, that hate him uh, and rise against them. Uh, so again, that you see both of these things uh, showing up within this blessing for the Levites in Deuteronomy 33, verses 8 to 11. We have this statement in 1 Samuel 28 to, to verse 6. And here it says, And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. So, Revelation from the Lord could come uh, either by dreams or by the Urim, uh, nor by uh, and and also by the prophets. And of course, Saul has 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 done that which God had told him uh, not to do. He spared the life of the of the Amalekites, kept their stuff. Um, he he started the battle uh, rather than waiting for Saul or for Samuel to get there. And, um, and because of these things, the kingdom would be stripped from, from uh, Saul and his family. And of course, it's David who will be getting uh, the, the kingship. Uh, and it is in, in David in whom the kingship shall permanently reside. Now, right after this, uh, Saul, having no other way of getting information seeks out the, um, uh, the the medium and and causes uh, he goes to her in secret and and of course um, has uh, the medium pull up the the uh, to communicate with the soul of Saul I'm sorry with the soul of Samuel so that that uh, he could get an understanding as to what was going on and of course these are the exact things that God, tells us not to do um, and it, it never goes well um, if things weren't bad enough already um, Saul is is uh, sliding deeper and deeper uh, into uh, the world and further and further away from the Lord we have in Ezra uh, chapter 2 verse 63 and repeated in Nehemiah chapter 7 verse 65 we have this statement in the Tish, Tishatha said unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things, right? This would be the, the uh, mencha, the um, bread that represents the covenant uh, of, of God uh, between God and man, uh, that they should not eat of the most holy things till there stood up a priest with Urim and Thummim. Okay, and, and so remember that breastplate and these these stones 
represent the the judgment of God and and they're saying that until one stands up to to provide these things to provide the light and the flawlessness I remember that's what the Urim and the the Thummim, uh refer to um, that they should not eat of these things now Ezra chapter 3 verse 2 just a few verses later tells us that it is uh, in, in here it, it's been uh, again uh, Germanized to Jeshua but look at it it's Yeshua so Yeshua son of of, of Jezadik, um, son of, of righteousness um, is he that it, that arises and along with the brethren of the peace to priests to in order to to allow them to then undertake restarting the sacrifices and then uh, therefore eating of the the holy things both the the offerings that were being brought the approaches the ascent approach uh, the menha uh, the the bread of the continual presence again representing the covenant that that resides within the holy place um, and all of these things now they could partake of uh, whereas before they didn't they hadn't identified and they were, were working at identifying but they had not been able to identify anybody who would could take that place and, and it's I, I don't think it's happenstance that in both both cases when Moses steps down and when the temple second temple is started that it's Yeshua that steps in uh, to uh, fill that role as high priest um, and, and or leader uh, and, and you have that dual role and of course we know that that now since Yeshua has come he fulfills both the role of of the the one that will lead Israel the king as well as um, and that that is um, the Moses was not a king that is the role that that was being fulfilled there to be the leader uh, and also the leader uh, the, the role of the high priest and he s satisfies both of those and sits at the right hand of God uh, making intercession for us and again with uh, Nehemiah 7 uh, verse 65 you uh, you have this identical statement as to Ezra uh, 2.63 interestingly Nehemiah doesn't tell us who it is that that stands up only that they do restart the the sacrifices but in Ezra it actually tells us that it is Yeshua moving on to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 12 the ESV gives us so that we who were for the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory now in the Greek uh, we see something a little bit different than that um, notice that this area that has been boxed down here and that has been highlighted in the ESV uh, who were the first to hope in Christ um, notice that there there's no uh, intonation from the Greek as to being the first um, we see that it says the ones having a prior expectancy in the anointed in, in the Christ um, and expectancy hope these things uh, would be reasonable um, to to um, uh, would be a reasonable translation um, and the question becomes is prior expectancy of first hope um, and I would just say that that uh, it isn't uh, you can think of Abraham who uh, longed to see Yeshua and has said that he did see him um, and so all of the the prophets from before also had a expectancy they just didn't see it as clearly as those who um, who were with Yeshua and so we could render that probably more correctly so that the ones having a prior expectancy in Christ might be to the praise of his glory and and recognize too that that prior expectancy is uh, is tied not just to um, that hope um, but remember the the prior expectancy is something that has been there since the foundations of the earth right even though we might not be aware of it until God reveals himself to us 
Uh, and then we have that understanding because the understanding has been given. But but before God laid the foundations of the earth, that that assurance was there and was going to come to pass. That's what we see in Scripture. So verses 11 and 12, if, if we look at that in um, in our, our uh, Greek adherence uh, of the ESV base that we start with, we would get in him, our lot was cast, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that the ones having a prior expectancy, having a prior lot that was cast, having been predestined in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. Right? It, it makes more sense when you see it that way than what you see in um, in the the uh, in the ESV and in the King James as they are, are manipulating the, the text. To, I would say to to kind of walk you down a rosy path as to what they want you to to understand. Verses 13 and 14 of the ESV read, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. And I would draw your attention to, to these red boxes. Um, notice that in the King James, uh, and less so in, in the ESV, you get something very different than what the Greek says. So the King James actually reads, in whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that, you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Okay, that, that's very different because in the King James, you are literally being given not just that something is occurring, but the the order in which they occurred. I mean, you think of the golden chain of salvation in Romans uh, chapter 8, verses uh, 28 and 29. Um, you could make that argument here that you have to trust, uh, then you have to hear, then... then um, you have to hear the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and then after that, you have to believe, and then you're sealed. There's just something not quite right with this. <clears throat> what we see in the Greek, um, and, and the way I would break this down for you, is we have um, these two snippets uh, that, that show up. Uh, at the very beginning, we have in whom uh, uh, also or and, and we see this also a little bit later, and we see this in whom uh, and believing, and if we we put that into the English, what you get is and believing in him, that's the in whom, so believing and believing in him, and that's how it would go together, and if that's how it goes together, then you should also be able to do and should be doing the exact same thing with the beginning portion of the sentence. Okay, well, in this case, rather than just one word believing, we're dropping in something that's quite a bit longer because we are being given uh, information as to what the saying of the truth, the logon or logos is what's being pointed to there of the aletheus. Uh, the, the, the logos of the truth, the, the word of the truth. And that is the, the gospel, the eugelion, uh, of, of your salvation. Um, and so you would actually put this together as, and you hearing the, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation in him. Again, we're... If, it, if it's that way, believing in and believing in him, if you use the same construction, this is what you would get. And you, hearing the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation in him, right? Because your salvation is in and of Christ, right? This, this is not a, a strange statement that's being made here. This shows up uh, throughout the, the New Testament, this concept, concept of uh, your salvation is in Christ in him. 
Um, and and so the other thing that that I would would have you note here is that that these verbs are both aorist tenses, and so they tell you that the action occurred, but they don't really tell you who did the action, right? Um, we've spent a lot of time on on that concept of whose faith it is, um, and the fact that uh, that scripture seems to suggest strongly that that the salvation is through the faith of Christ, and it the, it was His faith to go to the cross that then allows for uh, the the faith that is of righteousness, or the righteousness that is of faith to be given to individuals. And so Yeshua is that originator and completer of the faith, Hebrews uh, 12, verse 2. And so the faith that we have is not our own, but is the faith of Yeshua. So putting those together for verses 13 and 14, and, and 14, there, there's a minor, I wouldn't call it an issue, but uh, a, a common uh, see to to what we see in the New Test uh, in the Old Testament, which I'll speak to really briefly. Um, but if we put the the Greek in, um, what you would get is, is and you hearing the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation in Him, and believing in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of His glory. Now. That word inheritance in the Greek, the Greek word that's used there, uh, like the word that's used throughout the the Old Testament, when it talks about the inheritance of um, that was given to each of the tribes, uh, to the twelve tribes, of course, the inheritance of um, the of of the Levites is the Lord, uh, but the other twelve tribes physically get land. And we see that written of as an inheritance, but it's a tenancy. And that word in the Greek is tenancy as it is in the Hebrew. Both of those words um, line up perfectly. And in fact, I would say that, that you know, we don't really think of tenancy as, as being something of permanence for us. Um, you think if you own the land, then, then it's yours. But um, what what the Lord says is that he will give us these things in tenancy. So if we put all of these things together and read this, the longest verse of the Bible, and read it with the adherence to the Greek, um, what I would suggest that, that what you ought to be seeing here is, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing among the heavenlies, uh, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and flawless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have deliverance through his blood, the forgiveness of our offenses, in accord with the riches of his grace, which he lavished into us in every wisdom and moral insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, our lot was cast, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that the ones having a prior expectancy in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. And you, hearing the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation in him, and believing in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. I'll probably have a few more remarks to make uh, next week, uh, but then we shall be moving further into uh, the book of Ephesians. Uh, it's a very deep book. Um, I, I think that this study is, is opening for us uh, understandings uh, that I, I hope will broaden 
uh, the way in which we look at uh, the, the work of Christ and what he has done and, and how that work is accomplished. Um, and uh, we look forward to, to getting together with you again next week in fellowship. Uh, we'll now be back in the sanctuary and, and we will uh, live stream the class uh, for live uh, for sure, uh, God willing, uh, next week. So blessings to you all and shalom.